Hi, welcome to Cover to Cover for April 1998. I'm Lee Wolf, and I'm coming to you tonight from the digital desktop, the realm where video and computers collide and make much of the magic we see on TV and in the movies, as you'll see is the case in tonight's second segment. But first, for those of you who saw the film The Last Broadcast, you'll recognize this set as where engineer Tom Bransky was interviewed. Well, in reality, this is our own studio here at Suburban Community Television in Doylestown, and that was our own producer, Tom Brunt, who also put together this next segment on these two local filmmakers and the first ever desktop motion picture. A new era in filmmaking is about to be released to the world. Two filmmakers have recently achieved a cinematic first. The first high-quality feature film produced entirely on the desktop PC, without film. It could open up a whole new genre in filmmaking worldwide. This exciting innovation didn't take place in Hollywood, New York, or Europe. It happened in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Meet Stefan Avalos and Lance Weiler the first desktop filmmakers. So uh, Lance and I actually were hanging out one night, quite literally, and we said, hey, let's make a movie. Let's see if we can make a movie that costs no money to make. And uh, the idea was we had editing equipment, and we had camcorders, and we thought we could do it with that. And with those ideas in mind, we, uh, we started our journey on what we thought would end up being a movie that our friends and ourselves would watch over pizza and beer. And uh, instead, it became the last broadcast. I wondered why the man named Jim Seward would commit such horrendous acts of violence. of the film is, uh, is this. Uh, it's about a public access show called Factor Fiction. Uh, it's two hosts, Stephen and Locus, uh, have a paranormal variety show. Welcome to Factor Fiction. Uh, welcome to Factor Fiction. Yes, we are rolling. We are on. We are ready to go. Locus, you joker, you knew it all along that we were on, didn't you? Yeah, welcome to our new show. We'll actually so one day they take a suggestion from uh, a caller that says, you know, why don't you do a story about the Jersey Devil? Why don't you do a show about the Jersey Devil? Stephen's idea was to do a first ever live broadcast of fact or fiction. It would be broadcast simultaneously to cable television and the internet. So they decide to assemble a team. They bring a psychic, a paranormal sound man, and the two of them, and they go out into the, a remote area, the Pine Barrens, in hopes of finding the Jersey Devil. On December 15th, 1995, Stephen Avcast, Locus Wheeler, Ryan Clacken, and Jim Seward headed for the Pine Barrens of New Jersey to do a live broadcast in search of the Jersey Devil. Jim Seward would be the only one to return. A number of things link him to the crime and he's eventually convicted. Um, that's where we enter the story through the eyes of a documentary filmmaker uh, who is trying to search for the truth, trying to figure out what happened that particular evening in the woods. I'd come to this project with many of the same assumptions that you have concerning the Jersey Devil murders and the guilt of Jim Seward. His characterization as a troubled young man responsible for a spree of horrific ritualistic homicides in the Pine Barrens. The question in my mind was why? Why would a man commit such crimes? With the average film budget in the millions of dollars, one of the most remarkable achievements of the last broadcast was its budget, $900. That's right, $900. How did they do it? Basically, we made the last broadcast for 900 bucks. Uh, it was broken down into a number of different categories, uh, tape stock, uh, food, and gas. Everything else came for free. Uh, we used our family and friends as the cast and crew. Uh, we already had the computers, so uh, that wasn't a cost for us, and we can continue to use them. Uh, we borrowed uh, equipment from different friends and family, and uh, we used all different types of formats. I mean, the movie is really a consumer-grade film. 
meaning that we used uh, things like Tyco Vision kids cameras, which you can buy for like 60 bucks at a toy store. Used 8 millimeter uh, video, you know, camcorders. Used uh, some Hi8 and even used uh, digital video cameras, which uh, we were very fortunate to get from some friends. When we initially said, let's make a movie, uh, we really wanted to save money. We wanted to use no money. So the first thing that we got rid of was film, which uh, was, it was not a hard decision to make, but it was not necessarily one we wanted to make initially until we found the magic of video. The second thing we got rid of was actors, because actors cost money. So what we decided was to use our family and friends and of course ourselves because we thought that we would be the most reliable people in terms of showing up for a shoot. Once we decided we were going to use our friends and family, because we're not Barrymore's or you know, part of the Sheen family, none of us are professional actors, uh, we decided to create a situation where we're interviewing people. And what we did was we gave them the information that their character in the movie would know, nothing more, nothing less. And then we would ask them the questions and we told them what the answers were. But by just letting the camera run and asking them the questions and talking to them about the situation, they really started to get a sense and feeling that they had been part of the story that never happened, part of this parallel universe that we were creating. And as a result, we got uh, performances that people internationally have said, you know, are tremendous acting performances. And uh, in fact, the people are acting, but you know, at the same time, they're not. They're sort of just being. And that was one of the things that we were very uh, successful, actually quite, more, you know, quite a bit more successful than we thought we would be. But that was one of the techniques we used. I'm using this video camera just as a matter of convenience. Using film out here would prove to be logistically too difficult. Uh, hopefully we can get you some good footage and really try to demonstrate the uh, intrepid nature of speed and emotion. We're classically filmmakers, which means that we've really come from a film background, which means we really learned how to not run the camera because film is very expensive. With what we did, we kind of forgot about that and we could let the camera roll. And that was one of the best uh, things that we could do for our project and one of the big advantages of shooting digital video. And that, in effect, let us become high budget filmmakers because we shot about 27 hours of tape. Now, if we had shot, if that had been film, just the processing cost alone would have been. Sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars so we couldn't have done it. So that was one of the big advantages. And in doing that, we were also letting time, just you know, real time on videotape. And that was one of the things that was important for our story because we're really examining time and how time can stop and start and be quickened up and slowed down on, on tape. So it can be dangerous, but since we did come from a point of time where that was not possible, uh, we didn't overuse that. So that was just... We're really lucky about that. Classically, movies have been using computers now for, I'd say, 20 years in terms of using them a lot and not just as a novelty. Well, those computers used to cost $80,000, $100,000, $1 million. So when we, when we call this a desktop consumer type movie, this is a movie that uh, someone could go out to a store, buy the computer, buy the software, and make the movie. That's what we did. Uh, and because of that, it was really, you know, very cost effective. We, uh, we decided to use a lot of effects and transitions and things that exist with this stuff. And a lot of people kind of go over the edge with them and use them in really cheesy ways. And we try to see when we made this movie if we could do something where all these things would be incorporated, but not in a cheesy way, in a way that really worked. So, so we really tried to play with the idea of things that exist on the desktop and taking them to the, you know, to the limit. Even before the completion of the last broadcast, the future implications of this desktop film were enough to garnish national and international attention. The film has uh, taken us all over the place. You know, I mean, what started out as a little $900 thing is, has been like a ticket to multiple places around the world. And uh, we're doing the festival circuit with it right now. We'll probably continue to do that for the next year. And then we're going to do some non-theatrical things, showing it at different colleges and universities. And, the web has really played an important part in the, in the film, you know, there's a character in the story. The internet was the first of two interests that would attach him to the fact or fiction television show. 
The second interest was a bit more obscure. The internet th did play a very large part in the movie in terms of its life before, during, and after. We uh, use the internet as a part of the uh, story. It's, uh, it plays uh, quite a large part in the story. And also, we used it to start telling people about what we were doing. People could go to the website that we built, and uh, they could check out the behind the scenes, the storyline, um, the aftermath of what has happened with the movie, and so on. So it's been an invaluable tool. And w because of the web, we've even got a, uh, a nice list of people together for this digital tour that we're getting ready to put together, where we'll be traveling North America. The last broadcast made its world premiere at Doylestown's County Theater. Little known, the most who saw the film during its week-long run was the place in movie history that was carved here, for it marked the first time in the United States that a feature film was projected digitally to a movie-going audience. The last broadcast was projected through a new state-of-the-art video projector, providing a very film-like experience without being film at all. In the future, some may look back on the last broadcast as they do the first talkie, or the first color film, as an early pioneer that defined a whole new way to make movies. Perhaps the most encouraging words come from Wired Magazine. The Wired Magazine uh, lists us as one of 25 people reinventing Hollywood, the new Hollywood. And I think that's the ultimate irony in this, is that we're not in Hollywood. And that is what the new Hollywood is going to be. People, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, where, if you want to make a movie, you'll be able to do it. If you're out in the middle of a cornfield, in the middle of Iowa, you'll be able to make a movie. That is the new Hollywood. And that is uh, a very exciting thing.